So this, uh, I'm doing chapter five on cipher surfaces. Uh, so linking numbers, uh, which I have the definition for here, aren't actually until the end of the chapter, but I wanted to get them out of the way first uh, because there's a proof toward the end that I'm really excited about. Um, so yeah, so if we have two dis disjoint oriented knots in R3 or S3, uh, we can consider the regular projection and we just count crossings like we think you should uh, using the, the right hand rule. Um, and so the sum of all these plus and minus ones will be the linking number of uh, J under K. And so, so for example, you see the, the rule here, right hand rule here says the <laughs> plus one and minus one, right? So, so we have a few examples here and we need to look at only the uh, crossings where J goes underneath K. So in this example, uh, J is in blue, and so we're just going to pay attention to all the times that it goes underneath um, K. So here, oh, oops, let me get an orientation. And we're just going to compute. So we have J going underneath K at this point, and it's going to be a, a minus one here. You don't see? Minus one. We see J going underneath K here, and again, minus one. Are you doing a rewrite? Or like the yeah, I'm looking at J, the blue, and looking at where it goes underneath J, K. Blue, right over there. there. Back one crossing. Yeah, you're looking for red over blue. Yeah. It should just be the crossing oh, right to the left. I'm doing the opposite. Yep, yep. Sorry. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Minus one here. Yeah, blue going, oh, okay, I see. Blue going underneath here. Again, we get minus one. And last one. Here, minus one. So we add all these up. And the linking number is minus four. Is that dependent on the projection of the knot? Um. We'll see, well, so as you see here, if you, if you change the orientation of the projection. Yeah, like if you had a different picture of the same knot in the plane, I'm would not, you always have the same crossing number? You know, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Jesse, do no. you have any? No. It is dependent on the orientation of the, like it, so if he kept the orientation of K fixed and reversed the orientation of J. I mean, I mean projection, not orientation. Yeah, it's not Right, the but I don't believe it depends on the projection. Like, you, yeah, so there's like a minimal linking number. Yeah, okay. It'll always be the same, but it, you can like just twist two things more and get a different length of number, right? So it's not a knot invariant? Uh, maybe it's an invariant. I mean, yeah, I think it's an invariant. Somewhere. For minimal numbers? Any, I think any writer micro moves will preserve the yeah. linking number. Yeah, they, they should. Like, yeah, it'll introduce. Yeah, it's I feel like if you twist it, you'll have to untwist it to maintain yeah. context yeah. identity. So, like, if you, if you did a writer Meister 2 move, you would introduce. Two new crossings of J under K, but they would have opposite parity, so they cancel out. And two two uh, two diagrams represent the same knot or link, if and only if one can be moved to the other via a sequence of right moves. Mm -hmm. Which incidentally we haven't actually talked about, but. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, so here we're going to compute the linking number again, J under K. So look at all the points where J goes underneath K. So the blue under the red, and we have a plus one here, and then this one. Wait, why is that plus one? That one's actually minus one. Is that minus is it? Because the red curve is moving downwards. Ah, OK, yeah. yeah. <laughs> minus 1, and then we want, an, again, hold on, something in the second. Oh, okay. yeah, that one's positive. Yeah, this is. Yeah, this is the other we want, don't we want? Red over blue. 
So linking number to zero, right? Yeah. And so, and we have here that the linking number of two com completely disjoint um, links or knots is, is zero. So the linking number being zero does not yeah, doesn't mean that they're disjoint, <laughs> as this example uh, says. And so we also have this theorem, which I will not prove, uh, that the linking number of j under k is the same as the linking number of k under j. And if I reverse the orientation on j, uh, the linking number changes uh, by just a negative sign. All right, what's going on with this integral here? Yes. So there are, uh, Ralston gives eight, and I think eventually toward the end in, in one of the exercises, nine equivalent definitions of, of linking number, where, I shouldn't say equivalent, uh, nine different definitions of a linking number that are the same up to a, a sign. Um, and so this is one of them. This was my favorite one, apart from this one, this one is very visual, you can just compute it. Um, but here, uh, Gauss, certainly, he came up with uh, this definition of the linking number that is up to sign, that you get the same here, and so if you want to spend the time to compute that integral, you can. Uh, and so when you're, when you're proving certain things that link, where the linking number is uh, relevant, you might actually want to use this as opposed to this where you may not be you're just dealing in generalities and you don't have a, di uh, uh, a diagram or a projection. And so this is what Gauss came up with. You can look at all the uh, other definitions of linking number in the text. So now on to ciphered surfaces. I think this integral might actually be an answer to the question of does it depend on projection? Because what all this integral, I mean, I don't even think the integral depends on the parameterization you give to j or k. It just depends on. Yeah, but then it's embedding, right? In this case, like, does it grow the rest? Yeah. yeah. Like, what's the embedding? That's the cycle. Yeah, I have a question about that. Do, is there an easy way to see in the integral that it doesn't matter uh, that it's like this way through the integral? I do not know. I do not know. There's, um, there's something in the book that, that says that if you, you think of your links, or the, the components of the links in three space, and your homotopy, so that they're always disjoint, every step of the homotopy is disjoint, and your linking number stays the same as your homotopy. So that should be a way to relate it to changing the projection and not changing the understanding. Yeah. All right, so definition of a cyphered surface, what this chapter is primarily about. The cyphered surface uh, of a knot is a connected or orientable compact two manifold whose boundary is that knot. Uh, so just some examples. So these are surfaces, so I'm just using the red and blue to show positive and negative sides. Orientable surfaces, so you know they have two sides. Ah, yes. Now, uh, just as a visual aid to see what's really going on here, uh, when I first looked at this, uh, Jesse was helping with it, me with it, and I wasn't seeing what this picture is, so we're just going to Zoom in here. We have something that looks like this. And 
And so what this really is, if I were to pinch right here and pull down, we would just get you would just give a band. So I'm just taking like a strip of paper and twisting it. You just have a, a, a half twisted band. Mm -hmm. And so if I were a little ant walking along, a little man walking along uh, the blue side, once I reach this point, I would flip to the back and I'm still on the blue side and now I'm walking underneath this, this part. You guys can uh, see that. Some of you older students might and are, be very familiar with looking at these things, so it wasn't difficult for you. But that's what, that's what you're looking at here. And so this is a uh, this is a cyber surface. Anyone know for what not? Any first years? Trade uh, All right. And so non-examples help just as much as examples. And so this is, although it's a surface, it's not a ciphered surface. And can anyone tell me why? Any, any first years? Why is this? So it is a, it is a two manifold. It is a surface, but why is it not a ciphered surface? Anybody? So maybe I, I should first ask: Can anyone see what this is? What this surface is? Any first years? No. Okay. But, but Nick, where's the red side? <laughs> you can't see it, right? Okay, so it's on the it's in the back of the blue side. So this is actually a, a Mobius ship, right? And so we know that Mobius sh uh, ships are not on Mobius bands are non-orientable, and so therefore it's not a separate surface. Not a separate surface. All right, so I'm going to remind us. Well, I'm just going to state it. I'm not going to write it. The clash. Classification of closed orientable two manifolds. I won't state the whole theorem, but I will draw a free chart. Don't be disappointed in me. Okay. <laughs> All right, so every closed oriental two manifold is homomorphic to one that appears on this chart. Now, every closed oriental two manifold can be therefore fully classified by uh, any two of the following. We have its Euler char characteristics, so let M. Be a closed rainbow two manifold. Yeah, minus. Where B of M is the number of boundary components. And you'll see clearly why any two of these will fully determine what surface we're dealing with. And so B. So if I have any two of those, I can figure out the third, and I can number two is the G. Okay, enough. I said if you have two of them, you can have everything. Yes. Okay. All right.
transmission. The so now we have so we have these surfaces and we have we know that their boundaries are not and so we go ahead. Can I just say real quick this sure. formula one? So formula one that's for any surface with boundary. Um, so if you look at so up here these are closed surfaces. There's no boundary. And you can prove the Euler characteristic is 2 minus 2g. We proved that last semester. Yeah. Now when you have boundary, what that amounts to is poking a little hole or removing an open disk from your surface, which adds a single generator to your first homology group. So when you compute Euler characteristic, that subtracts 1 from Euler characteristic, which is where the minus b of m comes from. All right. So. The genus of a not K is the minimal genus of all its, I'm just going to abbreviate cipher surfaces, and we write the genus of not K equals genus of M, where M is a minimal ciphered surface. Now, uh, the so this definition is not well defined unless we know that every knot has a ciphered surface. So you mean, what does it mean about that? The which one? Or the right one? Hmm, put me on the spot here. Uh, let's see. So you can use the Euler characteristic method. Okay. Uh, you you talking about this surface of the truck over here, Ramon? Yeah, I mean, I, I know. Yes, I know it. How it's computed. So, okay. You just solve for g in the first. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna I have an example later where I'm going to uh, okay. construct a separate surface and then we're going to use retractions to okay. determine yeah, so it's fine. the the genus. So again, this definition of genus of a knot is not well defined unless we know that every knot has a ciphered surface of which it is the boundary. And so that brings us to the existence theorem or Sackert's algorithm. All right. So every knot a link. So the proof, I'm not going to write out in, in, in detail every step, but I, I can explain it orally. So we're, you take, take your knot, give, give it a knot case, I'm going to give you my example, am I doing figure eight knot? So you, you take your knot and you assign an orientation. And at each crossing, we are going to, at each crossing, we're going to remove the crossing and replace it by uh, what he calls shortcut arcs. So for example, if I have a crossing like this, we're going to move it, so we replace it with that. So we're just going to erase the crossings. Here, I'll do this. So I need to convince you
that replacing every crossing with these shortcut arcs will give me something that looks like this. to remove all the crossings and we need to replace it with these shortcut arc arcs. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to look at the is this the yes we're going to look at so this was an oh this <coughs> one here was an overcrossing going this way and so I'm going to follow the path along here and I have one of two directions I can go. I'm walking along this line. I can go right here and connect this or I can connect here. But if I go to the right, it's going to mess up the orientation. It's going to go against the orientation. So when you do this, you need to be conscious of the orientation. So I'm going to, be, I'm going to go left. Now, same thing. I'm going to, this, this was an overcrossing here. And so I'm, I can go either right or left. But again, if I go right, it's going to conflict with the orientation on this piece. So. This gets closed up. Similarly here, so that leaves, by default, that leaves me with this option, and here, this is the, all right, so, coming here, coming this way, coming this way, this was the overcrossing, and again, I can either go right here, connect here, or go left, I need to connect here, which means this must connect here, and then we do the same thing to get this. Okay. All right, and so these things are the same. Have I convinced you? Good. Mm -hmm. All right, so now what we need to do is, so each of these, so these are all on a plane, and we have two circles that are uh, in one circle inside another, and we need, we can just, since they're in a plane, we're just going to push, let's say, this little one off the plane just slightly, because what we're going to do is, so each of these uh, pieces, they bound a disc, and we're going to, depending on the orientation given by the arrows, we're going to color them according to the convention that counterclockwise is positive and clockwise is negative. So we have all right. And now the little little one on the inside should be red too. Or pink for positive. Mm -hmm. yeah, Did I? Yeah. Oops, I drew this. Of the outside ring should be your front, so Oh yeah, the outside ring is that's fine. And then I drew this wrong. So I think the big circle should be going counterclockwise. According to your original diagram, mm -hmm. oh, man. Yeah. little circle. You know, I gave it the opposite orientation than what was in my notes. Oh, so <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I just fixed that picture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the weird point of view. <laughs> All right, here we go. Okay, that's, that's exactly one. <laughs> All right. All right. We convinced. We convinced. Yeah. Okay, and what we're going to do is, so now we have these three disks, and the way to look at this is, this is, we're looking from a, from a bird's eye view here, so you have this disk, this red disk, we're seeing the bottom of it, if you will, and you have this, the big blue disk here, and a smaller disk up here, and we're looking at, from a bird's eye view. And then everywhere where we removed a crossing, we're going to replace
We're gonna we're gonna connect these discs with half twisted strips whose boundary was the original crossing. So for example, if I have I'm going to put this, this strip in here so we get something that looks like All right, and so here's the, here's the picture. So we're going to do that on each of these. I guess I can do it here. Let me draw. All right, and so actually this, because this red band is connected to the bottom here, this actually is not here. This is not part of the boundary. And similarly, these red blue, blue meets blue. And so you can convince yourself yeah, so, so again, so you, do we all see what this surface looks like? We're kind of looking at it from a bird's eye view. You have a big disc here. This disc is sitting up a little bit higher. And these also, twisted bands. Those boundaries that we're talking about. Ah, uh, yes. And so you can convince yourself, if you trace out the, the white uh, line that's still remaining, that that which is the boundary of the surface is, in fact, this no. Now, to answer Roman's question, uh, so we know that uh, Euler characteristic is preserved uh, under homotopy, and so these disks are uh, simply connected, so they're retractable to a point. Right? And so we're going to just visualize with me. Uh, we're going to eat. Right? Contractible. The sphere is simply connected, but it's not contractible. Disks are contractible. Right. Did I say something connected? What did I mean to say? You meant right. contractible or collapsible. Probably. You can shrink them to a point. Yes. So we all believe that we can shrink disks to a point. So this disk here, this big disk, and this small disk here, we're going to squeeze them all to a point. And each of these bands, we're going to collapse them to their core. And what you're going to get is, uh, so you have you can, this is the top disc, this is the big disc here, we just, we shrunk them, and we have this one here, collapsed, and now these bands are shrunk to just lines, shrunk to their cores, and so we have what we have, two here, and we have two here. Now, we know how to compute the other characteristic of this, right, 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 we all know if this is M, So there's no faces, there are three vertices, and there are four edges. Does that answer your question, Ramon? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now what's the genus? Ah, yeah, yeah. It is. What surface is this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. You know, I have to prepare for these things. Oh, OK. So what was the formula the, we had? Yeah, 2 minus 2g. Minus b. Minus the boundary. Made that so yeah. set that equal to negative 1. And then uh, you have one boundary, right? Okay. Let's see. 
can't repeat these things in my head. So, yeah, just you write, write it up. Two, so we have one minus minus one minus one over two, one minus negative two. Yes. So we have a sphere. Uh, no, <laughs> genus two surface. This is uh, a genus, yeah. not the other picture. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We have the two torus. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So. With a. There should hold on. This should be a torus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's negative one. So negative one equals two minus two g. Minus four. And the formula is usually order characteristic plus one. I think you're. Oh yeah. Zero plus yeah. Ah yes. This is a plus here. We get zero. There we go. So it is actually a torus. With one boundary. I apologize. <laughs> All right. Keep track of your signs. Keep track of your signs. So the boundary component okay. on that torus is the original knot. Yes. All right. Can you really draw the knot nicely or the surface nicely? Okay, so in the last part of this, I'm going to attempt and succeed in. <laughs> proving to you that genus is additive. All right, so I'm going to state these things. I'm not going to write them down. I don't want to waste any more time. Uh, so, yeah, like what's that? They're going to prove it. No, no, I'm going to prove this, but there, I, have, I have some facts. So the minimal sign for surface may not be unique. You may have many surfaces for the same knot um, that have two that have the same genus, and they're both minimal. Um, here we go. So, given two knots, K1 and K2, I can, the genus of their connected sum is the sum of genera, right? Genera. Genera. <laughs> genera. Okay, proof. Genus is Uh, have you defined the next sum of knots? Or are you going to in the proof? Um, I have not. Uh, <laughs> <It'll>, <laughs> I have not defined. <laughs> you'll, see, you'll, you'll probably show us in the Yeah, you'll, I'll, I'll, you'll, you'll, you'll see what it is. See along the way. Okay. okay. So I'm. Okay, so I've given two knots. I'm going to let F1 and F2 be uh, any minimal separate surfaces for each of them. And the. Children. The boundary connect sum uh, of these, of F1 and F2 of these surfaces, will have genus. Will So I'm going to draw a picture to convince you of this. Yeah. I'm going to keep this picture here because I'm going to use it a lot.
Yeah, there we go. Okay. Uh, and uh, two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Press two. And one. Yes. And, you know, I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I'm going to use it. I just really don't want to use it. You know? I just I really, it was Okay. <laughs> just, yeah. <laughs> Should have just left it, huh? <laughs> 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 okay. Third time's a charm. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Say it too early. Oh, I should have left it. Okay, we come around. This one's this guy. No, that's the chance. And then, yep, this one cuts you off. This one. Yeah, it goes inside. Crap! Oh, yeah. You want to try to jump it? That was fun. Okay, here we go. Fourth time to try. Okay. Alright, I need to get this because we need to get this. Okay. Crossings on the bottom. <laughs> Jeez, man. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I did this yesterday and it was fine. Okay, and to connect these, the boundary connects them, we're going to take a a little piece here and a little piece here. Oh boy. Really? Why was this a nice. the other time? Jeez. So the, the picture you have right now is the connect sum of the two knots. Yes. Mm. All right. And so I hope that this picture convinces you that when I take any two minimal cipher surfaces for K1 and K2 and I look at their connect sum, it will be a ciphered surface for the connect sum of the knots. And therefore, it will have genus the sum of the respective genera, which will be Going the other direction is I wanna wanna keep this here. Okay. So we are going to pick a minimal cyber surface for a minimal cyber surface for the connect sum.
4k1 k2 and so when we find so we, we we're going to start out with a minimal separate surface for the connect sum this is the example we want to find another minimal separate surface which happens to split as a boundary connect sum let's say f1 f2 for k1 and k2 and once we do that we will have So our hunt is for this uh, other minimal separate surface. Now, I don't want to redraw that, so we all good with that? Everyone copy that down. So, th so the hunt is for this F12 prime that happens to split uh, as a boundary connect sum of uh, F1, F2 for K1 and K2. All right. And so I think this gets into uh, how we, given two surfaces, how we take their uh, boundary connect sum. To be to, to allow it to be um, constructed. So what we have here is we have a we have a sphere, and this this piece is inside the sphere, and this is popping out here. So let me draw. Yeah. No, that was fine. And so this is where the the surface is poking out of the of the sphere, and so we we just picked a minimal separate surface for f uh, for the connect sum k1 k2, and so we may have uh, something we may have some weird things going on like this. We may have these tubes, we may have these bumps. Put a star by this by this guy. So we may have these these weird things going on with our surface when we uh, so we, we have our surface and we put a, we try to put a sphere around it. And to, to split it up, to split up each piece in a boundary connect sum. And so what we the, the goal to find F12 prime would be to get rid of um, all the uh, of, of all these tubes, of all these intersections with the sphere that we don't like. We want to have the this surface intersected with this with the sphere be just this orange arc, right? So but where this sphere comes from is the you know you're working with the connect sum of a knot. And you can the way you can you know a knot is a connect sum of two knots if there exists a sphere interset intersecting the knot in two points, which contains one of the knots inside the sphere and the other knot outside the sphere. So that's where this pink sphere came from. So like on the inside of the sphere is one of the knots, and the outside of the sphere is the other knot. But because the cipher surface we're working with might be kind of crazy, there could all be all these like tubes and, and bumps poking out of the sphere. A priori, we don't, we don't know. But what he's about to do is show us why, if that does happen, we can just get rid of it. But the sphere, the sphere comes because we're talking about the connect sum of the knot. That's something we get for free. Thank you. 
right. Okay, so what I'm attempting to show here, so this is the surface of the of the of the sphere here. And so as Roman mentioned last week and as Jesse commented last week, we give it any two manifolds, we can intersect them in such a way that every point on their intersection, um, how do I say this, uh, that they intersect transversely, right, which means that every point on the intersection, <laughs> every point on the intersection, um, you can look at the, so, I can look at the tangent space of P. And so if for every point in the intersection this, this occurs, then we know that the, uh, that, the, that the sphere and the manifold F12, they intersect transversely. And the probability of this happening is 100%. So if we have any anything like this going on, which we do not want because, for example, if you can, this point is just, is just touching the surface of the sphere. And so looking at the tangent space around this point uh, for the tube here, and looking at the tangent space of the sphere at this point, they're going to be, it's going to be the same plane. And so you don't have transversal intersection. You can't get back the whole the whole space, and so Jesse said that this is transverse intersection. In in this case, we have the tangent planes uh, coinciding with one another, so we can't get the whole space back. And so, but we can, we're allowed to just, we know, since we can always have transversal intersection, this we can get rid of by just moving it off the surface a little bit. And so, intersecting like this, is also something we can get rid of. These are two circles intersect, touching at a point. We can just move it up or move it down a little bit um, so that we can have transverse intersection between the sphere and, and this uh, F12, this, this surface. And so what we will still be left with is, oh, sorry guys, we good? Finish up quick. What we still may be left with is that the intersection will, will definitely have uh, this orange arc and uh, simply closed curves on the sphere. So we'll have something that looks like. So I'm just going to draw the intersection. Exactly one arc and a bunch of circles. So the in, this is um, what I'm drawing here is the intersection of F12, our, our surface here, with the sphere. And so this is what we're going to be left with after we uh, intersect them transversely. And so the goal will be to get rid of all these simply closed curves, get rid of all these circles in the intersection. So you're just left with this one arc. If you remember before I started adding tubes, this this arc was the only point of intersection with the surface, and in the sphere, and so that, that's our goal to get F12 will be to remove, excuse me, remove these, these circles. And now I'm keeping you guys, I'm almost finished here. So those tubes are three dimensional. I mean, they're part of the surface. They're so not like flat. Excuse me, yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah, these are all no tubes here. Okay. And then, so what we're going to do is start with the, any one of the innermost circles here. And now, there's going to be a finite number of uh, simply closed curves of circles on the sphere. And we know that because, wait, wait, because S2 and this uh, surface are compact, and the intersection of compact, uh, right, 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 compact uh, manifolds is compact. And if there weren't a finite number of these circles, then we would have a open cover of the intersection that didn't have a finite subcover. So 
there is a finite number of central closed curves so on the on the intersection and so by induction I can just show you how to get rid of one of those circles and we can get rid of all of them and so last little bit here um, we're going to start with an innermost circle and innermost just like it sounds just means that it's a circle with no other circle inside of it you can just think of it that way and what we're going to do is first of all notice you can do that because we're in a sphere and in the sphere there is a disk and then in that disk you take the image okay, right you cannot do that in every circle just in the sphere and the disk okay that's very important okay. <laughs> see so notice that the innermost circle since uh the innermost single closed curve it bounds a disk and so what we're going to do is and we we did this last semester I think Jesse showed us at the very end, we we're proving the classification of uh, closed or interval to many folks. We're gonna do some surgery where we cut along the, I'll draw it here. Green over there. So this is, you can see it. Uh, this is the this is the sphere. The purple is the sphere, and this is one of the tubes on the intersection. And so that those green simply closed curves is what this red part is. And so it bounds a disc on the sphere. And what we're going to do is we're going to surger along this disc. We're going to cut it, and we're going to do the cut and paste. So we're going to cut along this disc and then what we're going to have is something that and then we're going to so we just cut along here and then we're going to attach two discs here, and what we're going to do is, if this is the outside of the sphere, we are going to just totally get rid of this piece, and the piece that doesn't touch the boundary of the surface. Okay. So like if in your picture, one of the tubes, the part on the inside of the sphere is the part you want to throw away. It's the part, it's the part of, it's the piece of the surface after surgery, ah, which yes, touches yes, yes. the boundary. Yes, so we just surgered along, for example, yeah. the disc here and the disc here. And so I want to get rid of the, yeah. the unnecessary bubble. Yeah, exactly. I want to get rid of that, and here I'm going to get rid of this. And then in the final step, I won't draw it, but now we're going to just push this down, and it will have the effect of Doing something like that. Now, uh, real quick, last comment, and then we'll be done. And so this is so I can do this for all the intersections, for all the tubes that intersect the sphere. And this tube here that I starred actually cannot be there because if it were, the surgery that I just described here would reduce the genus, which increases the oil. Excuse me, increases the oil characteristic, which reduces the genus which is a contradiction because we assume we, we assume that we started out with a surface of minimal genus. And so this tube actually isn't here. So you don't have anything that's connected here that connects all the way here. And so doing that, you obtain the F12 prime that I referred to. And so you will end up with the only intersection of the sphere with this surface will be the orange arc and that's exactly what you want. So, hope that wasn't too confusing. <laughs> Thank you for sticking around. Sorry for going over.